good morning. Uh, so my name is Peter, and this presentation is going to be about uh, the data standards that we're using within the OBIS uh, community. So Ward has uh, already told you a little bit about how OBIS works. So uh, our central database is located here in, in Ostend, and every few months we will harvest the data from our regional and thematic nodes uh, who receive their data sets uh, from hundreds of, uh, of data providers. Uh, this can be uh, Excel spreadsheets, uh, CSV files, and so on. So uh, the only way that we can aggregate all these data into a, a central database is by assuming uh, some common uh, data format somewhere in the, in the data flow. So the way that uh, the nodes are uh, doing this is by publishing their data sets on uh, uh, some server software that is, uh, that's called uh, IPT. So once a data set is published on, on IPT, it becomes available as a so-called Darwin Core archive. And this is a format that, uh, that OBIS can, uh, can easily uh, read and, and interpret. So these Darwin Core archives actually built on another standard, uh, the Darwin Core. So this is a standard that's uh, managed by, uh, by Tadwick. And it's basically a huge collection of uh, terms uh, or fields or columns or whatever you want to, to call them to share uh, biodiversity uh, information. So uh, Darwin Core was uh, ratified in 2009 by Tadwick, but it has some history before that with uh, version uh, 1 being published in 98. Uh, so if you want to get an overview of all the terms, you can go to this page uh, on the Tadwick website. So. Here you have uh, first an index of all the terms, and then for each term you have uh, a definition and uh, usually some uh, examples uh, as well. Okay, so back to Darwin Core Archive. So um, while the Darwin Core is just a collection of terms, uh, the Darwin Core Archive standard uh, describes how we can use these terms to make uh, a self-contained uh, data set that can be exchanged uh, between people or between uh, machines. So a Darwin Core archi archive is basically uh, just a zip file with some text files uh, in there. So you'll always have two XML files. Uh, the first one being the archive descriptor. So this file tells you what all the other files in the archive uh, are and what they contain. And then there's the EML file which contains the data set uh, metadata. And then uh, you also have one or more text files which contain the actual data. So these are just uh, CSV files or, or text delimited uh, files. So um, Darwin Core Archives use a so-called star schema. So this means that you'll always have one core file and around that you can have some, uh, some more files. This is optional, but you can have uh, extension files. Um, Core files can be uh, about uh, species occurrences, uh, they can be about sampling events, about taxa, and uh, there are many kinds of extension files, but uh, the most uh, used extensions are about uh, occurrences or uh, measurements. Uh, there's also always a, a one-to-many relationship between records in the core file and in the uh, extension files. So a very basic Darwin Core archive uh, would contain just uh, an occurrence file, uh, but if you have uh, measurements, environmental measurements or biometric measurements, you can uh, add a measurement or fact uh, extension to your archive. So in that case, uh, for each uh, record in the occurrence table, there would be uh, one or more records in the, the measurements uh, table. Uh, you, can also always, uh, you can also have uh, an, an event core file. So in that case, you would have sampling event information in your core file. And then linked to these sampling events, you would have uh, occurrences in the uh, extension file. And so on. So there are many possible combinations of uh, core and extension uh, files. Uh, so each of the, the cores and extensions uh, have uh, a limited set of Darwin core terms that you can use. And if you want to see the definitions, you can go to this page on the GBIF website. So first you have the core definitions and then you have the uh, extension definitions. So 
For example, if you want to see the, the terms in the uh, occurrence score, you can go to this file. And then you get an overview again of all the, the terms that you can, can use. As you can see, there are uh, a lot of terms, but we have some guidelines on the OBIS uh, website uh, to help you uh, identify the terms that are useful for, uh, for your data sets. So if I go back, I can, I can go to the extension definitions. Um, for example, measurement or fact, which I mentioned before, can be found here. So in a measurement or fact table, you can put measurement type, value, accuracy, uh, units, and so on. OK. I'll just show you uh, one example of a Darwin Core archive file. So this is one that's on the Eurobis uh, IPT. So now I've downloaded the archive. It's a zip file, so I can just uh, extract it. And it contains uh, four files. So the uh, first one is the, the archive descriptor. So here it tells me that there is one core file in this archive called occurrence.txt. And then there's a list of all the, col the columns in this, uh, in this file and how they are mapped to the Darwin core terms. And then below, uh, you have the extension files. So there's just one in this case, measurement or fact.txt. And again, you have uh, the columns in, uh, in this CSV file. Then there's uh, the EML. EML stands for Ecological Metadata Language. And this contains uh, the metadata as, uh, as XML. So you have a uh, organization name, uh, title of the data set, uh, the people that are responsible, uh, contact information, and so on. And then you have the actual data. So first, there's the occurrence score file, which has, which has all the, the species uh, occurrences. And then linked to that, you have some measurements which are very boring in this case. Apparently, it's all muddy sand and keel bay, so. OK. Yeah. So let's go over some, uh, some terms in, uh, in Darwin Core. Uh, so first set of terms is about uh, location. So you'll find uh, a lot of, uh, of terms uh, for describing the location of your of your species occurrence uh, at different levels, levels, so from continent, uh, island group, down to municipality. There's also the locality term for describing uh, the most, uh, or for entering the most uh, specific location description uh, that you have. Uh, in some cases, this is a, a station name, for example. Uh, but most important for us is that you have uh, longitude and latitude and uh, decimal degrees and also an uncertainty on your uh, coordinates, uh, which is in, in meters. Uh, so for this, you have these three terms, decimal longitude, decimal latitude, and coordinate uncertainty in meters. There's also a geodetic datum. Uh, and within OBIS, we've agreed to always use uh, EPSG uh, 4326, uh, also known as the WG WGS84. Uh, and there's uh, footprint WKT. I'll talk about this in a minute. Uh, there's also fields uh, for putting uh, an identifier for your location. So for example, you can use uh, the Marine Regions uh, website, which is a catalog of, uh, of location names. So um, if you have a location name and you want to get some coordinates for that, you can look it up here. And then uh, you can use the ID from Marine Regions in this uh, location ID field. And then, of course, there's a depth in uh, minimum depth in meters and maximum depth in meters. So if you have a sample from, uh, let's say, uh, 20 meters depth, you can put the same value in, this two, uh, in these two fields. Is that sample depth? Or That's sample depth, yeah. Uh, we're adding bottom depth ourselves to the records in OBIS, uh, but I don't think there's a, a field to, to put uh, bottom depth. Uh, so some possible uh, issues uh, with coordinates. So these are all values that we uh, receive 
uh, in our database. Uh, so of course, uh, many values are not in uh, decimal degrees, so we cannot uh, con cannot use these. Uh, sometimes values are outside uh, our reference system uh, limits. Uh, so longitude less than minus 180, more than 180, and so on. And uh, number formatting issues, uh, if you're uploading a text file uh, to IPT, make sure to use uh, a point as a decimal separator and not a comma, because this will not be interpreted as a, as a number by uh, IPT. Um, then about footprint WKT, so uh, in many cases you don't just have uh, point coordinates for your occurrence. Um, for example, if you have uh, line transects, uh, if you have uh, bottom trolls, uh, uh, net toes and so on, uh, you won't have a point coordinate but you will have uh, a transect. Um, and to add these to, uh, to your records you can use uh, WKT. Strings. So WKT stands for a well-known, uh, and now it escapes me, a well-known text. Um, so, for example, these are, are line strings. Um, in other cases, for example, if you're doing bird observations at sea, uh, if you have satellite imagery uh, or very vague uh, location names, uh, you want to add a polygon. And for this, you can, can use a, a polygon WKT string. Okay, so some examples. Uh, for example, if you have a, an occurrence from uh, Harlem Bay, and that's all you know, you don't have a specific uh, uh, coordinates, um, you can look up this name in green regions. There you will find an ID, so you can add this in, in location ID. Uh, you can also add, or you should also add, the, the location midpoint uh, in uh, decimal longitude and decimal latitude. Um, but then you should also at the uncertainty, which will be fairly large in, in this case. So uh, for Halong Bay, for example, this would be uh, 26,000 uh, meters uh, around your point coordinates. Uh, if you're sampling at a station, usually you have uh, very accurate uh, coordinates. So in that case, uh, you can have, for example, a coordinate uncertainty of 50 meters. Um, and here also the depth information uh, has been added. Uh, if you have a troll, um, you can add point coordinates, a radius around that, uh, and then if your troll was between 5 and 10 meters uh, deep, you can add uh, 5 and 10 meters in the depth fields. Uh, and then I've, I've also added a, a line string here for the, the, the transect. So fortunately there are some tools to, uh, to obtain all these uh, values. So the first one is our map tool. Uh, you can do uh, many uh, things with this. For example, if you want coordinates for, uh, for just say, a point location, you can just click on the map and you will get uh, longitude and latitude. Uh, if you have uh, a polygon, you can use this button here on top. You can draw your polygon. There you go. So now you get here at the bottom, you get point coordinates, you get a radius. So these you can use for decimal longitude, decimal latitude, and coordinate uncertainty in meters. And then if you click the WKT button, you get a WKT string as well, which you can add in the footprint WKT field. Uh, you can also look up names uh, in marine regions from this uh, page. So the example I used before was uh, how long Bay. So there you go. So there are two entries in marine regions. Uh, so if I pick this one, it gets added to my list. Uh, again, so I have point coordinates. Uh, it doesn't give me a radius uh, here. So I, I would have to calculate this myself. Uh, OK, second tool is an R package. Um, If you have a lot of coordinates as uh, degrees, minutes, and seconds, and you want, we want to convert them uh, in, an, in an automated way, you can use this, uh, this package uh, to do this. Uh, so it, it can cope with a lot of different uh, variations of this, uh, 
of this coordinate format. Okay. And then there's marine regions, which I showed before. Okay, uh, then terms for uh, time. So there are terms for year, month, day, and so on, but, but actually uh, we ask to put all your time information in the event date uh, field. So um, in this field you can use uh, the ISO 8601 standard to put your dates, your times. Uh, it doesn't just support points in time, but also time ranges. So if you have a start and an end time, um, for example, for a, for a plankton uh, tow, or uh, if you don't have any accurate uh, time information, then you can use a, a time range. Uh, so if you have um, a basic date time, this is what it uh, would look like. So first you have a year, month, and then day. Then there's a time separator, and then the time as uh, hours, minutes, and seconds. If you just have a, a date, you can uh, omit the, the time part. Uh, also, if you just know the year and the month, you can leave the, 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 the day uh, away. It also supports uh, time zone. If there's no time zone uh, indication, then it's assumed to be local time. Uh, but if you have a time zone, you can add it uh, at the end here. Uh, this one is a time range, so here you have a start time, then a slash, and then an end time. And the last two are, uh, are some uh, special cases, so if you have uh, four digits and then three digits, this is uh, year and day of the year. If you have uh, a year and then W and a number, it's uh, 2014 week 26. So these are not okay. Uh, here someone used uh, slashes instead of dashes for the, the separator. Uh, in this case, so there's no uh, T separator here, but this is actually not a problem. Uh, according to the, the standard, you can uh, put a space there as well. But the problem here is that the uh, leading zero is missing uh, in the hour. So that's important. Uh, here also you have uh, uh, missing leading zeros. This one has been, I guess, exported from Excel or something. Uh, it's not okay, uh, and so on. So just time is also uh, not uh, not accepted. Then there's terms for uh, taxonomy. Most important terms here is are scientific name and scientific name ID. There's also a term for the authorship. Uh, then you have terms for uh, kingdom, phylum, and so on, all the ranks, or well, not all of them, but uh, most of them. Uh, there's taxon rank, and then there's some terms uh, related to the identification. So who identified uh, the, the, the specimen, uh, when was it identified, uh, some references, uh, remarks, and then there's uh, identification qualifier. So scientific name uh, should contain the, the lowest rank at, at which you can identify uh, an organism. So if you're sure about uh, the genus identification, you put the genus in there. Uh, don't put any other information. Um, if you have uh, like uh, affinis or confer, you can add it in the identification qualifier field. Uh, if you look at uh, the definition of uh, scientific name uh, in Darwin Core, you will see that uh, it's recommended to put the full scientific name, uh, including the authorship in there, but uh, within OBIS we have a slightly different recommended practice and this is to uh, not include the authorship, so just uh, the species name. And then scientific name ID, there you can uh, put an identifier for your uh, scientific name and we recommend to use uh, LSIDs from the World uh, Register of, uh, of Marine Species. So this is what they look like, this is a URN and this is the, the ID that's used in the, in the worms uh, database. So some, some examples, if you have uh, identification at species level, you put the species name in here, species ID and scientific name ID, no qualifier. If you're not sure at the, the species level, you just put the genus name and scientific name and the genus ID and scientific name ID. So 
So then we have a bunch of uh, identifiers for your records. Uh, the first one is uh, institution code. So this is the institution that has uh, custody over uh, your collection or your data set. Then there's collection code. This is uh, an identifier for your uh, data set itself. And uh, so within one Darwin Core archive, uh, this should always be the same uh, value. Then there's a catalog number. This is uh, an identifier for uh, each record. And this should be, of course, be uh, unique uh, within your data set. And then there's occurrence ID, and this should be, if possible, globally unique. Uh, so one way uh, to ensure this is, is by constructing uh, a URN uh, using the institution code, the collection code, and the catalog number. Uh, then there's record number. This is uh, an identifier that has been assigned at the time of, uh, of collection. And in individual ID you can use um, for identifying an individual organism. So, for example, if you're tracking a whale or a bird or whatever, you can add the same ID to all the records for this, uh, this animal. So, some examples. So, as you can see here, we've constructed uh, an occurrence ID uh, using the institution code, collection code, and catalog number. Uh, then we have uh, two more identifiers that are really useful for uh, adding some structure to your uh, data set. These are event ID and parent event ID. And these are especially useful if you're using uh, an event core. So if you have a core file with all your samples, your subsamples, and so on, uh, using event ID and parent event ID, you can construct a kind of uh, sample hierarchy. So in, in most cases, I guess you have a, a crews, you have stations, you have samples, subsamples, slices, and so on. So you can link all these together using this uh, event ID and, and parent event ID. So this is a small example. So in this case, I have uh, uh, one event table. So this has a, a record for my cruise. Then it has a, a record for the station. Uh, then it has two grabs and, and a subsample. And as you can see, so the, the station is linked to the, the cruise, the grabs are linked to the station, and the subsample is linked to the grab. And instead of uh, replicating all the location and date information in all these records, I can just add the, the location information to the station and the time information to my individual samples. So once you have this uh, event table, you can uh, create uh, an occurrence table here. And using event ID, you can link these occurrence uh, records to the events in the event table. So in this case, I have two uh, macrofauna uh, occurrences in the grab, and then uh, one myofauna occurrence in a subsample. Uh, quantity. Um, so there is one term, individual count, that has been used uh, a long time for, uh, for quantities in, uh, in Darwin Core. And then there are four new terms, uh, organism quantity and quantity type, and sample size, value, and unit. Uh, these are quite new, but actually, uh, within OBIS, um, we have recommended practice to put all your measurements, uh, including the ones of, uh, of uh, biomass or abundance, um, to the measurement or fact uh, extension. This is an overview of uh, our uh, required terms. So we have seven that you need to have in every uh, record. Uh, event dates, of course, uh, coordinates, uh, scientific name and scientific name ID. So we ask you to match all your scientific names uh, with uh, the WORMS database and add their IDs in, uh, in your data file. Uh, I didn't mention occurrence status. Um, Occurrence status uh, indicates if a record is presence or absence. So in the past, we had mostly uh, presence data, but to have more and more absence uh, data, so it's important to indicate uh, that records are absence and not, uh, not presence. And finally, there's a basis of record, which is uh, the only term that's uh, required for Darwin Core archives, so you have to add this one uh, as well. Uh, some possible values are um, indicated below, and so I guess the, the most used ones are human observation and machine observation. 
So uh, human observation, that's obvious. Uh, machine observation, you can use this, for example, if you have uh, uh, a video plankton recorder or some other kind of device making, making observations. Uh, this slide is about ranges, so uh, maybe you noticed, but for all the dimensions that we have in our data, we can add ranges in, uh, in, in Darwin Core. So for your coordinates, uh, we have uh, longitude and latitude with a radius around that. For uh, depth, we have a minimum depth and a maximum depth, and in event date, we can add a start time and an end time. So you can construct like a a box around your observation with all the uncertainties in, in time and space. Okay, so the second part of this uh, presentation is going to be about uh, OBIS ENV data. So this is a, a project that we did uh, during the last year uh, to overcome some problems that we had with the Darwin Core uh, archive format uh, when we try to add um, environmental data and biological measurements to our uh, data sets. So uh, what exactly is the, is the problem? Uh, so a very simple data set uh, would just be an occurrence score. Uh, but as I told you, the, um, the options for structuring your data set are a bit limited with just occurrence score. You, you would preferably use uh, event core for that. And also all uh, information related to, uh, to, to sampling or environmental measurements and so on would need to be replicated in, in every occurrence uh, record. So for example, uh, if you have a sample which has a temperature measurement, you have some occurrences uh, attached to that. Um, if you would want to put this in uh, an occurrence score file with a measurement or fact extension, you would have to add the temperature to both your uh, occurrences. So uh, event core is, is better in a way because uh, you don't have to replicate all the, the information related to, to your samples uh, and also you can construct this uh, hierarchy of, of events. Uh, but there's a problem with this. So I told you about the, the star schema. So you have a, a core file in your archive and then you have extensions attached to that. So the problem here is that uh, if you have a measurement or fact extension, your measurements can just be about your events and not about your occurrences. So this is okay if you have temperature measurements, for example, but this is a problem if you have, in addition to that, you have body length of your organisms. Uh, so yes, this is a, a Darwin Core uh, archive with event core measurement refract extension and, uh, and occurrence extension. Uh, as you can see, so the event core has, uh, has an identifier uh, and then the extensions link to this uh, identifier. So the, the occurrence extension will link to your event ID and the measurements will link to your event ID, but there's no way to make a link from your measurements to your occurrences. So the solution uh, we came up with was to uh, to create a new version of this measurements extension and uh, adding an occurrence ID field there. So in this case, you can you will still link your measurements to your uh, events in your core file, but you can also link to the occurrence IDs in your occurrence uh, extension. So basically this uh, new extension is just uh, the, the existing measurement or facts extension but with some uh, added fields. So first we added the occurrence ID to link to your uh, occurrence records. And because we were creating a new extension anyway, we added some, uh, some extra fields uh, to make the, the data sets more machine uh, readable. So before you just had measurement type, measurement value and measurement unit. But with these new uh, terms, you can add identifiers for all these uh, values. So this makes it a lot easier to, uh, to analyze these data sets uh, with, with computers. So for these uh, identifier fields, uh, we are going to use uh, the vocabulary uh, of uh, BODC. So this is the web page. If you go there, you can 
search for vocabularies, you can search within vocabularies. Uh, so some vocabularies that, that we're going to use are uh, the P01 vocabulary. So this for has, for example, um, abiotic parameters such as uh, PCO2, but also uh, biotic measurements. Uh, for example, this is uh, actually dry weight. Then for the units, we're probably going to use uh, PO6 a lot. So, for example, in PO6, you would have degrees Celsius. Uh, for devices, there's a L22. For example, this has uh, an entry for a CTD device. And we're also going to create our own uh, vocabulary for uh, terms that are missing in the, uh, the existing uh, vocabularies. So just an example. So this is a part of a measurements uh, table or file. So for example, you can have a measurement type uh, mesh size. So this is not really a measurement, but more a fact probably. Um, and as you can see, uh, there's an identifier for uh, mesh size. So you can add it in the measurement type ID. Uh, then you have a, a value, uh, 200 uh, micrometers, for example. So then you would put uh, the 200 in measurement value. Of course, there's no ID for that. And you can put the unit and measurement unit, and then the identifier for the unit and measurement unit ID. Uh, sampling gear, this also has uh, an identifier. And the value for this fact would be, in this case, uh, a WP2 plankton net, which also has an entry in uh, L22. OK, that's it for now.